So this is our Thursday evening Q and A, uh, and and I don't know about you, none of you are on yet, but uh, I get excited about this. So <laughs> I really like these sessions together, actually, because the questions arise from you. So that's what I love about this time together, um, is that the questions really arise from anything that's there for you. And I, I truly welcome you to bring forth any of your questions and good evening, everyone. Hi. And, uh, and in that way, I, I really actually, I get quite excited for our time together um, because it's so directed to the things that are, are going to be beneficial and integrated in your own lives. So any questions that are there this evening, I welcome them. Hi everyone. Welcome to everyone. Did everyone see the hail today? I don't know if it was where you were, but it was where I was. And uh, wow, when I started hearing it upon the glass through the sun, it was just absolutely spectacular to, to see this kind of majesty of nature in her play and dance. Welcome everyone, seeing various friends, beauties hopping on, namaste all. So questions, I invite you in the comments below, so where you see your names, to put any question that you really have that may pertain to Ayurveda or the Vedas in general. I guess you can ask me random questions from other places in your life as well, but that's the intention, the sankalpa of this time together. So anything that would be of benefit to you, I really welcome you to, to, to put your question there and, uh, and together we'll explore a bit. So just so everyone's aware also, these um, afterwards, these live Q and A's, they always go up onto not IGTV, but onto our website. So if you go onto the website and you go into our blog section, you'll find that you can go back to the Q and A's uh, that are there from previous weeks. And many people ask because they realize that there was a question or two that was really applied to them and they didn't necessarily write things down. So you can always hop on to see old Q&As that are there. Hi all, welcome everyone. So this is our Q&A session through Rasa Ayurveda that uh, we host every Thursday evening at 7 p.m. here Eastern Standard Time and welcoming any and all of your questions that may be there. This evening you can type them below and, uh, and then we can flow into this. Uh, Melissa's asking, what's on your self-care plan list? Do you mean for me, Melissa? Is that what you mean, what's on my self-care plan list? That's a neat question, <laughs> if that's what you mean. Or do you mean on a, the self-care plan list that we give to you? I'm wondering which one you mean because uh, I don't want to talk about me if you're asking <laughs> yes to which. <laughs> Can you clarify? Let me know, Melissa, what you meant by that. If you mean my self-care plan list or the one that we send out sometimes, the Dinacharya list that we send out to all of you with our Dinacharya kits. So you let me know about that, Melissa, then I'll answer that one. I'm going to hop to Cheryl's question. Um, Cheryl is saying, hi, I received my order today of the copper bottle and Tulsi tea. Thank you. I hope it's okay to ask a question about the copper bottle. What is the best way to keep the bottle clean and how often to clean it? Yeah, so the neat thing about copper is actually that copper is self-cleaning, but I'm not saying that you don't clean your bottle. But what's really amazing about it and one of the properties that's so beneficial of drinking what's called tamra jal, so drinking water that's infused by copper, that's what we call tamra jal, so jal means water or jala, uh, means water, tamra, copper. So water that's infused with copper is that it's cleaning also uh, internally. So when we start to drink it, it clean, cleans what we call in Ayurveda, the Parisha Vahashrutta, which is the channel from the mouth to the anus. So it's the channel of waste, in fact. And it does a great cleansing. It's one of the many, many benefits of drinking from copper, whether it's a copper water bottle or we have, this is the first time I'll announce it, but we have some copper, beautiful hammered, artisanally uh, hammered copper cups that have recently arrived and will soon be launched and, and offered on the Ross Ayurveda website. So you can check that out soon. And so... 
the bottle in and of itself, the water is very cleansing and cleaning. Um, and so you don't have to worry too much that the bottle, when and if it starts to tarnish or something like that, that, uh, that you're ingesting something that's not gonna be so good for you. You wanna clean it like you would clean a glass. So of course, if there's any debris, if there's anything, you know, and we really suggest not putting anything else into your copper water bottle. So don't put tea, don't put smoothies, don't put uh, juices, really it's for water. Just put water in it. But then I would suggest giving it a good wash, especially every week, even if you're soaking your water, uh, each day and then um, and then every week giving it a nice wash you can wash it just with uh, dish soap your regular dish soap hopefully a, a green or natural dish soap that you use um, you can put it in the dishwasher if you want but it'll tend with the heated water to tarnish a little bit more quickly which is also fine with copper if it does if it tarnishes and if you would like to give it a clean that will really um, bring back the shine of the copper then you can use a little bit of lemon so the lemon both on the outside and the inside will help that shine to come back as well as baking soda can do that as well and even a bit of salt water washed in it is a great way so putting salt and, and a bit of warm water into the inside of the copper bottle and giving it a good shake will give it a good wash so you don't have to be too concerned about how you wash it or even if you get that bit of tarnishing on it so I really hope you uh, I hope you enjoy that and notice the benefits as well Cheryl and really I'll just highlight that drinking out of copper is something that I really really suggest especially at this time for all of us, if we have any concern about warding off, whether it's bacterial or viral infections, drinking out of copper is an easy and simple way that you can really cleanse the system and you can increase your immunity and the alkalinity in your system, thus increasing immunity. Copper water in and of itself is an adaptogen. It's, it's an adaptogenic uh, water. So it wakes up the body to its own immune defenses. So I really would suggest for everybody to be drinking copper water, which means soak it overnight. Put a really clean, beautiful spring water, whatever water, uh, well water, or just a good high quality water into your bottle or into your cup overnight. Let it soak and then drink it in the morning. Try not to drink it cold, but rather room temperature. Okay, and then I'll go back to Melissa's question. So Melissa's question is, what's on the self-care uh, plan list? And she said, mine. So my self-care plan list, it's been so wonderful to have this time right now uh, when I returned from India. Really, there was the invitation at that time to be in isolation. It wasn't yet the invitation to be in quarantine, but I actually took it upon myself to be in quarantine just in case because I went through a lot of airports, various things to take care collectively. So I didn't see uh, anyone during those two weeks and it was a beautiful time of retreat. And so... What I see as self-care is really taking care of knowing the self. And so absolutely there are Ayurvedic rituals and I have Dinacharya that, um, that I'm committed to each and every day. But more than that, what's been so beautiful is the time of silence and also the time of really having uh, space for two meditations every day. You know, Lisa, uh, my beautiful partner in Ayurvedic crime, she, uh, she asked me the other day, how the heck do you have enough time in the day for those hours of meditation? And I said, well, with this isolation and, and uh, quarantine, it seems to be making its way. It seems to be able to, to give us spaciousness. So I would say the self-care now more than ever. You know, I worked with a few different individuals today and I was really highlighting, we're given the gift now to really implement these things into our lives. And even when uh, we go back, whether it's in a different way or however it might be to our employment or to, um, to a more active or dynamic life, if we can stabilize some of these uh, rituals into our lives now, we're going to notice the way in which this is, is going to improve not only the longevity of our lives, but also the quality of our lives. So every day I really enjoy, you know, everything from a prayerful wakefulness, like waking up into prayer, the quietude that's really here. I'm noticing even though I'm in Peterborough and, uh, and I'm quite downtown, there's a lot of quiet that's here to the mornings collectively. Um, noticing and then moving into some of the beautiful uh, Dinacharya rituals. So I especially love each morning having my nasya, doing also my oil pulling. Uh, Abhyanga is a ritual that I love to do each and every day and I also uh, very much um, love some of my bathing rituals. So also in the evening it's been really nice to take some aromatherapy uh, baths and also some baths that use uh, some of the the essential oils and some of the oils sometimes I even use our abhyanga oils in the bath 
as well. So all of these things that have been wonderful during this time of, of quarantine. And of course, cooking and making food. And so, so much self-care. Thank you for asking, Melissa. But I think um, if you're asking more how you can apply that into your own lives as well, I would say really, really welcoming the spaciousness that this provides and, and the time it provides to really uh, touch into what's important to you. And so if Dinacharya, if a daily routine and these rituals are new to you, go onto our website, rasa-ayurveda.com, and we have a whole section about Dinacharya, and we have various videos that are there for you. So please welcome yourself to go there, check out the videos, and it really teaches you how to go through these steps. The other thing I want to share is that for the last month, I've been sharing daily uh, mornings, and then it's been Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. 30 minute sessions, so there's many now, there's about 25 of them, about Ayurvedic Dinacharya, all the different steps, and you can find those on my own YouTube, we'll carry them over to Rasa soon, so Tiffany Nicholson Smith, you can hop onto um, my own YouTube and look at each one of those practices, and why we do them, how to do them, all those things, okay, so welcoming you to really find your own uh, uniqueness with, and your own medicine with your own daily routine and your own self-care. Okay. Leslie's asking, if I have intestinal issues and go to the washroom frequently, is it okay to take Trifula? Also, please explain the skin purge product. Yeah, okay. So if we have intestinal issues, it depends on what those issues are. And this is why in Ayurveda, as I've shared with many of you before, it is really important for us not to sort of apply things like might be currently applied even in the health and wellness field where we go to a health food store we've heard that something's a great adaptogen or something is a you know a fantastic new superfood and then we all buy it without really knowing the relationship it's going to have with us ayurveda is a relational medicine and i keep repeating this and what i mean is it's a presence-based medicine so it recognizes what is the relationship going to be with this specific activity or situation or herb, whatever it might be, and my being now. So it's a presence-based medicine that recognizes what's going on now here, and will that really be effective, and will it be nourishing for me now? So even saying, is it nourishing for that person, even steps outside of the gift and the, the wisdom of Ayurveda, which says that person now, in this specific situation, in this specific season, at this specific time of their life, right, with their specific constitution, but also with their specific uh, imbalances or, or movements. So in that way, when you say I have intestinal issues, I find it really important to ask the question, you know, what would those be? Although I can read that you say go, going to the washroom frequently. So with Trifala, Trifala does have a gentle, what we call lakana, a scraping effect. And with that, it can improve uh, elimination but it actually is very balancing for elimination. So for some, it increases elimination, but for others, it just generally is a tonic for both the digestive system and also the eliminatory system. So what I would suggest with Trifala, even if you're going to the bathroom frequently, because this can be what we call Tiksh Agni, Tiksh Nagi Agni is a high uh, Pitta or a high Agni. And so we can tend to go to the bathroom more frequently than others. The, the uh, stool can be a little bit more liquidy, a little bit more soft as well. But you see Trifala, this beautiful herbal complex that, uh, that is made up of three different fruits. It's such an amazing um, herb and, uh, and it's really revered in the tradition for so many different reasons. But it's made of three fruits and each one of those fruits has its own doshic connection. So it's actually tridoshic also. And so yes, it can have the effect for some that it will increase movements, it will increase uh, elimination, but for others, it can also help to actually balance some of that, especially some of that pitta that might be there. So what I would suggest is low dosage. So in that case, I would suggest taking Trifala just a quarter teaspoon in the evening in a little bit of warm water about a half an hour before bed. So just once a day, quarter teaspoon in a bit of warm water before bed. If for any reason this going to the washroom frequently increases, then you stop immediately. If it doesn't, if it just seems to either stay as it is or starts to balance out, then the trifala might actually be helping with some of the underlying um, issues that are there. Otherwise, in trifala, there is an herb called amalaki, which, um, well, 
let me not say that now. There are three herbs. So there's Bibitaki, Harataki, and Amalaki. And each one of them, as I said before, has their we paused for a second, has its own doshic correspondence. In that case, I would welcome you to write me uh, independently, Leslie, and then I will suggest one of those three, depending upon what's going on, one of those three for you to take on its own. So one of the three from uh, Trifila to simply take on its own, which can help with sometimes if we're going to the toilet frequently. Then she asks also, also please explain the Skin Purge uh, product. So the Skin Purge product uh, is also, it's one of our potions. We have 12 different potions, which are internal formulas that you can take. They're powders. So they're powdered super herb formulas. Uh, they're a complex of different super herbs. Some of them have also super mushrooms or super algaes. They take the gift and the wisdom of Ayurvedic medicine as well as Ayurvedic formulation and they combine both Eastern and Western herbs. So we've brought uh, a symbiosis of those coming together and they're coming, uh, all the potions that we have, the 12 potions are all organic and vegan, wild crafted herbs, so the highest potency. They're extremely, extremely um, potent. And so taking them in this um, churna form or in the powder form is one of the most potent ways we can take herbs besides directly having the pata, having the leaves or making tea or decoction or something out of the leaves, but taking the churna rather than making them capsules or making them uh, tablets. Instead, we've given them indirectly in these churnas so they enter from here and they continue to work through the whole system and, and get absorbed. And so the skin purge potion, people often say, oh, is it something like I put on my skin or no, it's an internal purge. So what it does is it actually cleanses the blood very strongly, cleanses the blood, also uh, cleanses the liver. And it also helps a little bit with digestion and absorption. So three of the main areas that tend to affect what is radiating or not out through the skin. So all of us notice it, right? Depending upon what we're eating, even though I remember in the 80s, we were told if, uh, if you, 80s, 90s, you know, when I was growing up, if you have acne or your skin, it's really not uh, dependent upon what you're eating. So don't guilt yourself. It is dependent upon what you're eating. There are other things as well, but of course our skin glows and radiates. Something happens with our skin when what we're ingesting is in alignment for us. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're eating crap, if your skin is expressing certain imbalances, it just means that maybe your food is in an alignment for your constitution. So the skin purge potion, cleansing the blood, cleansing the liver, and also working on the digestive system, working to balance Jatar Agni, working to balance the digestive fire, it will really, really help to also then enhance uh, the skin and cleanse the skin. So many of the, the herbs that we've put into the um, skin purge potion are excellent for everything from uh, acne to eczema, psoriasis, especially many of the pitta conditions. Actually, pitta dosha, the fire dosha, the, the element of fire is correspondent to pitta. This constitution, it tends to have more challenges, we could say, of those kinds of um, manifestations on the skin. So acne, eczema, psoriasis, general dermatitis, rashes, hives, all those kinds of things tend to express themselves when there's uh, an imbalance with pitta. There's so much more I could say to this, but it gives you a little bit of a, a tiny bit of an understanding around this. So this helps some of the herbs that we've put into the formula. We've put some very high vitamin C um, herbs, things like camu camu, things like sea buckthorn, which comes from the, the high Himalayas. Sea buckthorn is an amazing medicine and super herb, both to take internally, but even to use on the skin. I still remember the first time I was introduced to sea buckthorn, I was uh, hiking in Nepal at the time and uh, spending three weeks out in the Himalayan range and um, the women there had plucked sea buckthorn berries directly and had juiced them. And I remember the first time drinking that under the mountains. I don't think I will ever, ever forget uh, the sense of connection that I had to the earth and to those women and, and to that moment also. So it is a potent, potent um, offering of the earth and to be able to be afforded the opportunity to take it in and to have a relationship with sea buckthorn still to this day it's such a beautiful gift. So I'm just mentioning a few of the things that are in, in the Skin Purge Potion. We've also put neem. Neem is such a powerful antimicrobial, antiseptic, antibacterial, antiparasitic. 
So if there's any storage of ama, if there's any storage of waste, of toxicity, that's held itself in the blood or in the liver, this will also help to be flushed out of the system. So that high vitamin C, as well as some of these other herbs, turmeric, other ones that we've put into the skin purge potion, they all really, really help to balance out and to cleanse those, those three areas, as I was mentioning before. So to cleanse the blood, to cleanse the liver, and also to balance and cleanse the digestive system. And also from the inside out to give a great boost of nourishment. So, you know, some of them again are adaptogenic, so they help to decrease stress and they help to really improve vitality or ojas. So the Skin Purge Potion is a lovely one that I would really suggest uh, if you are dealing with any skin issues. You might take um, it a couple times daily before lunch and dinner. So you could mix it with a little bit of warm water or another option is to mix it with a little bit of aloe vera juice or a little bit of pomegranate or cranberry juice uh, with a tiny bit of honey and then to take that in before, um, before those meals of lunch and dinner, about anywhere between a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon, depending upon your physicality. Okay, other questions? Welcome, those who are hopping on. Samantha's asking, do you have suggestions regarding constipation? I have a suspicion that my one coffee a day might be an issue. So it's an interesting one because a lot of us are dependent upon coffee for various reasons, right? So we're dependent upon coffee because we need that boost, because we're not sleeping so well, maybe because we're not eating so well. I'm not necessarily saying this is your case, Samantha, but there's a, a whole host of reasons, derivatives, you know, all these reasons that lead to the point where we start drinking coffee or we just really, you know, we like the ritual of coffee drinking also. This is when the viewers start to drop because people are like, oh God, don't say something about my coffee, right? But... Of course, coffee, and this is what Ayurveda offered, every offering of the earth, every plant, and even, in fact, you know, every uh, living particle of life in Ayurveda is considered to be medicine at the right time and the right place for the right person. So that means even in Ayurveda, we use minerals. Even mercury is used at times, but in an ash form. I'm never using mercury, and don't worry, Rasa doesn't have any products with mercury, but classically in Ayurveda, it was used. Diamonds could be used as well. So there's many things that would be used um, that could be considered medicine. So similarly, of course, coffee has its own medicinal benefits in the right time and the right place. And so a lot of us will use it both for the wake up, but also uh, because we believe that it helps us with elimination. But it's oftentimes a false help because it helps in the moment, but long term what it does is it creates internal dryness. Coffee has the rasa, the taste, so there are six different rasas or six different flavors, um, tastes of astringency. So it's astringent. And that astringency creates dryness. It puckers everything up. So when you, like, if you eat a coffee bean or a cacao bean, you notice that everything puckers a little bit, right? So your system does that also when you introduce coffee. So when you introduce coffee, everything gets a little bit more condensed and a little bit more dry. And that's not really what we want, uh, or specifically just that, for our uh, intestine and for also for our intestines and also for our colon. We want there to be lubrication because with lubrication, there's also a flow. That lubrication allows things to carry through. Astringency is also needed, but lubrication is also needed. So in long term, if we're drinking coffee consistently, it can create so much internal dryness and that dryness, a direct relationship with that dryness in the system, whether it's uh, due to coffee or it's due to other things in our lives, eating dry foods, generally racing around in our lives. So we've created a, an internal and external friction, uh, not um, drinking enough, not having very much uh, demulcent or moistening foods and, uh, and things that we're ingesting. So there can be various reasons why we have internal dryness. But one of the direct representations or symptoms of dryness, internal dryness, is constipation. Nothing can flow, so it all gets blocked and held. So the stool may be well formed, it may be you know, there, but it can't pass through the body because there's too much dryness. And then it requires straining, or the stool comes out in small pellets rather than in a formed stool. Um, you know, there's pain or there's hemorrhoids because we have to strain also. So starting to switch out your coffee. I know that sometimes even just me saying this, you know, especially on North American or, or, uh, or European soil, people are like, I love you, but I hate you, right? So 
The thing is, is that coffee, I occasionally, occasionally tell someone that it's okay that they have a coffee once in a while, but that's a very specific constitution for, cer for certain people at a certain time in their lives and in a certain, you know, movement of their lives, it might be okay occasionally, but it's really a rarity that I ever say that to anyone. What I see more than anything is that it's causing a lot of digestive, energetic, as well as nervous system and eliminatory uh, system issues for a lot of us. The quality of the coffee, the times that we drink it, how much coffee we have. So many of the ways in which we are using coffee is self-medication. It's out of, you know, we need it. We need it as sort of an addiction um, rather than looking at some of the reasons that we might need the coffee. So if I can suggest, I would suggest we have created a coffee, uh, an herbal coffee replacement. And it's what's called our Ayurvedic coffee at Ross Ayurveda. And I specifically formulated this with heart and love for each of you, because I'm very aware of the implications of taking away someone's coffee. <laughs> so I intimately know this. I was married to a, a avid co coffee drinker <laughs> for quite some years. So I know what it is to, to really uh, yearn for the coffee. And no, the coffee addiction did not create the divorce. <laughs> so coffee, in this way, if it's a ritual for you, if it's something where you feel like, uh, like don't take away the ritual, I really feel the creaminess, the settledness, the taking those moments at the beginning of the day is what I love, then this coffee replacement we have can offer you the same robustness. It has various things, everything from Ramon nut, which is an amazing superfood and nut that comes out of South America and Guatemala. We've put into it also dandelion, which is very purifying for the liver. So the amazing thing we've also put into it, ashwagandha, shatavri, brahmi, brahmi, which is excellent for the brain. So the beautiful thing about this coffee replacement, because there are coffee replacements on the market, is that one, it's gluten-free. So you have no issues with that because some of them are not. Two, everything in it is organic and vegan. But three as well is that this coffee replacement, it doesn't just replace coffee, it actually has super herbs and it has super grains in it that are going to help to actually start the day off with cleansing the system, removing ama, removing waste, and at the same time giving you, adapting you both adaptogenic herbs and giving you a nervine tonics that will cognitively improve um, memory will improve your uh, focus, will improve concentration throughout the day. So this is the beautiful thing about this Ayurvedic coffee supplement. And it will also improve uh, your elimination as well. So that's some suggestions around that, Samantha, as you're asking. Okay, I see a question from Dominique. So Dominique says, I have dealt with chronic bloating for many years. What's the best way to combat bloating? Yes, yeah, so Dominique, uh, similarly, bloating tends to be a symptom of vata. So it's a vata imbalance. So when vata, which is the air element and the space element, increase, they literally create more air and space in the body. So that space starts to increase even in, the, um, in bloating. And so um, there's a few different reasons that can, you know, there's quite a few different reasons that that can arise. So it's really difficult for me to answer sort of a, one generalized answer of how we can combat bloating but let me give you a couple things so one thing that i would definitely suggest is to have warm meals so don't have dry or cold meals so really make sure you're having warm meals and meals that are easy and simple on the digestion that have some unctuousness which means that have some creaminess to them i don't necessarily mean dairy creaminess but that have a little bit of oil softness to them so think something like a butternut squash soup or steamed veggies. Don't be having like dry rice crackers with hummus, very drying for the internal system, going to increase bloating. Don't just have a raw salad with like raw, you know, shredded vegetables on top of it, very cold. And also, even though we think of, you know, the lettuce as being moist, it's because of its coldness, it's internally drying, it will increase bloating. So you wanna think instead to have warm meals and also have meals that have a good amount of softness to them. So soft or, or a good quality, oily uh, quality to them. The other thing I would suggest, because sometimes our vata patterning in our life can create this bloating in how we eat, is to really sit down and have three good meals a day. So have three really well-positioned meals. And what I mean by that is maybe like an 8 a.m. meal, a 12 o'clock meal or 12 1 o'clock meal, and then a meal around 5 o'clock 
well positioned, a good cadence, a good rhythm in when they come in the day and have a good portion at each one of those meals. Don't just be snacking throughout the day. Sometimes the vata tendency around how we eat is to graze. And when we graze, that dries out the system because we're not really ever getting enough bulk in the system. So a lot of air keeps entering to fill it up. You see, everything needs to be working in our digestive system. There is a certain aspect of water and earth that's there to help with digestion of fire and also of air. But if we only introduce a little bit of food, everything's trying to be churned and there's so much more room for the air element to be moving and so much more space as well and churning and that bloating can actually increase. So really try to have three good uh, quantity um, meals throughout the day and it was often suggested in Ayurveda to have what's called an Anjali so to have uh, two um, handfuls put together or rather Anguli so to have these two uh, hands put together in sort of a cupped form so that would be uh, your meal size you know when it's kind of masticated right some things of course in their lightness like lettuce or something this wouldn't be much but to have good size meals warm and also with some oily oil to them and not to graze too much and then also with how we eat to really sit down so to sit down for the meals and to really feel into the receiving of the food to look upon it to smell it then to taste it to hear it as we chew it or as we touch it to have a relationship actually with eating and this can really really help the bloating as well because oftentimes if we're talking the entire time while we're eating or we're eating over the pot, you know, or we're driving and drinking our smoothie. Although with social distancing, maybe that's not happening as much anymore. I bet a whole heap of digestive problems are gonna, you know, be softened out because of this. So instead stopping and really being with the food and chewing is going to help a lot with, um, with bloating and digestive issues. So those are some things I can suggest. One other thing I can suggest is taking a little bit of a digestive tonic before you eat. So we've created four different spice mixes at um, Rasa Ayurveda, and they're for each one of the doshas, or rather each one of the digestive systems, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, and Tridosha. And I really suggest for those of you who are not quite sure um, which is your, your dosha or what vikruti, what current state you're in, then I would suggest uh, maybe purchasing the Tridosha spice mix. And you can take a half a teaspoon of that in warm water and drink that before each one of your meals. Otherwise, if you really are dealing with a lot of bloating, take the Vata spice mix and do the same. Half a teaspoon and a bit of warm water. It'll be a bit like a broth. It's a mixture of spices, it's quite nice. Drink that and then begin to eat your meal. I hope that helps, Dominique. Okay, we'll still go for a little more time because I see we have various people hopping on and, and asking questions. So uh, Chelsea is asking, hi Chelsea, daily practices for kapha uh, imbalances. So for a kapha imbalance. So kapha is, uh, especially as an imbalance, we start to feel it in density. So it can be feel it felt in heaviness. It can be felt in this sort of heavy lethargic feeling, inertia. It's the earth and water elements. So everything can be feeling a little bit damp, heavy and dense. It can feel a little cool as well. So we want to think of opposite qualities. The way we talk about this in Ayurveda is that there are 20 guruvadi gunas or 20 qualities or 10 pairs of opposite qualities. So 10 pairs of opposites. So if we can locate what the qualities are of what we're dealing with, then we try to bring the opposite qualities in our food, our lifestyle, and also in anything we're ingesting, both what we're ingesting in our mouths, but also what we're ingesting through our eyes, what we're ingesting through what we're listening to, what we're being touched by and what we're smelling. So ingestion actually in Ayurveda is through the five senses. Your questions are amazing this evening, by the way. Very, it's so beautiful to answer in this way. Um, and so understanding that we look at the qualities and then we meet it with the opposite. So this does not require you to be an Ayurvedic doctor. All of you are your own medicinal knower. You already know you are made of that. You are made of the essence of what it is to be in health, in swasta. You are swasta. It's your very birthright to move as healthfulness. So in recognizing that, you already know these qualities and you can feel, wow, there's an excess of density here, or I'm feeling unmotivated, I'm feeling a little bit kind of damp, everything's a bit sluggish. So bring the opposite. Again, diet, lifestyle, and also through the five senses. So let's think of the five senses, for example. 
if you're feeling inert and unmotivated, go gaze, you know, spend some time in nature where you're gazing upon things that are uplifting and motivational. So that might be sunny environments, right? The sun does something to all of us. It, it brings the fire element. I'm not saying to gaze directly at the day sun, although there is a practice in the Vedic tradition of gently gazing at the sunrise sun, which actually motivates and wakes up kapha. But go spend some time in which you see things in movement, in flight. Look at the, the uh, trees as the wind moves through them. The wind or the air element is helpful for kapha to see and to experience or to feel the air on, on, uh, on the body, on the skin, is excellent because kapha can feel so dense and want to stay indoors and want to stay you know, closer to the earth. Go skydiving. <laughs> then you'll really feel the wind uh, on, your, on your body. I wonder if they're doing social distancing skydiving at present. <laughs> When I did paragliding years ago, there was definitely no social distance. You had someone right on your back, right, taking you. So um, think about the elements, so the opposites. So what are some other things that can be done? In your diet, you want to be avoiding things that are dense or heavy or that are excessively wet as well. Right? So instead, you want to have things that are warming, that have a bit of spice to them. You want to have lighter things as well. Right? So things that bring uh, lightness. So even think about the way in which you're cooking things. So if you're used to having, you know, heavier, dense pastas or risottos or paella, you know, I'm speaking to you all around the world, you know, these heavier, dense, like kind of grain based dishes. Think, OK, maybe I'm going to have something lighter like steamed greens. Right. So what would that uh, what would the difference be in the energetics of having something like that? And then in our lifestyle, we can think of all sorts of things, the things that we're engaging with. If you're watching news right now every single day, twice, two times a day, it can be heavy. It can be dense. So instead, watch or listen to something that's inspiring, that's uplifting, good news. You know, there are certain sites even here on Instagram that have good news, uh, little offerings each and every day little good news tidbits about, you know, really how things are shifting. I was just sharing today some good news um, in India. In one month of lockdown, now the waters in the Ganga and the sacred Ganges River have been tested and they've been tested to be potable, to be drinkable. Only after one month of people being in lockdown. For the first time in 30 years, people close to the Himalayan range who have not been able to see the Himalayas are finally able to see the entire range. Those are beautiful good news things that literally lift up our kapha. So watch things, listen to things, have conversations that are uplifting, that are energizing, and also do things that are energizing. So this is a kapha season. Spring is a kapha season. It's heavy, it's damp, right? So I was thinking about the hail today, heavy and damp, right? It's wet and it's heavy, it's coming at you, and they were huge. So in that way, go do things in, um, in your lifestyle and in your exercise that are going to bring warmth. Go for a run, do a seven minute hit, you know, and of course we didn't have these in traditional Ayurveda, but it's the Ayurvedic wisdom applied today. Do something that's gonna get you warm and motivated. You know, grab your kids with you or grab someone beside you or go with your dog or go on your own. You know, I do this on my own. So go and get that, that uh, motivation moving as well. So, so many different things. Start a new creative project. You know, do that hobby that you've never done before. These are good things to get your, your kapha moving. So I hope that helps uh, looking at those different areas. Also from, you know, what we have at Ras Ayurveda, this is the thing, you know, I'm not here to sell you our products at all. The whole product line, it came from working with individuals. I used to make people individually each one of these products or tell them where they could get them. But what we noticed was that in the Canadian market, especially, these were very, very difficult um, to source. And beyond that, they were unsourceable to the quality that we now share through Rasa. And I can say that very humbly, actually. We feel very grateful to source the quality of organic and wildcrafted herbs that we do. And it's incomparable to anything else that's offered on the Canadian market currently. So as far as kapha uh, beneficial products, you can use things like the kapha spice mix, like I was mentioning to our last questioner taking the kapha spice mix and mixing it into your food or taking it as a digestive tonic before each one of your meals, it's going to wake up the digestion, stimulate the digestion, wake up appetite. It's going to help with metabolism. You're going to notice that some of the heavy sluggish, sluggishness after your meals will be helped. The kapha tea. 
So our kapha pacifying tea, it helps to stimulate warm energize. So taking that throughout the day can be wonderful. Using the kapha sacred essence, our Gaia tree essence, it's an aromatherapy blend that's a roll on. And just by rolling that on throughout the day, it's very inspiring, uplifting. So there's a few different things. We can also do dry brushing or use the kapha abhyanga oil if you do want to use an oil. So we have a whole host of kapha balancing products as well. Okay, I hope that helps to you, Chelsea. She said she's also dealing with chronic bloating as well as depression. Depression is, uh, is absolutely a, a symptom of, of kapha. And I want to say that very clearly for all of us. It's a symptom. It's not something finite. So I want to be really, really clear about that. So many of these things that we have taken to be, in an allopathic standpoint, we've taken them as though they are clinically finite. Like I have, we've given a, a, an ownership to them. I have depression. I have anxiety. I have, there, there's so many times I hear this. It is something that's moving through you. I want to honestly say this. It is due to an energetic imbalance in your structure. And as those energies find their way back into their own natural accordance, into their own natural balance, that symptom no longer needs to live there. It does not need to live there. So everything I just mentioned can help so much with SAD. Some of us may be experiencing seasonal affective disorder or depression, whether it's long-term or short-term, or just generally also in this time, I'm very aware, I'm very compassionate to all of us, the fact that some of this isolation may be creating that. Get out in nature, it's inspiring. And as the nature also suns up and warms up, this will also warm up your heart. But also um, any of you, each and, each and all of you can always reach out to me. I work with individuals also one-on-one. -on -one. So that may be an opportunity as well. Um, I also want to mention that there is a, a practice that I recently offered on both Facebook and Instagram Live, but it's also on my YouTube, Tiffany Nicholson hyphen Smith, that is, it says something about energizing. So you can look, it's more a kapha balancing practice that helps to warm and stimulate, energize and inspire. But please feel free also to reach out if it would help any of you to work one-on-one -on -one as well. Okay, and that bloating is probably because there's a sluggishness in the digestion, which can be very much helped with the kapha tea and also the kapha spice mix, especially. Okay, just looking to see if we have other questions. Okay, Maneshak is asking, what are safe herbs to take when you're prepping for birth or post-birth? Oh my goodness, that's such a big question. <laughs> it's a beautiful question. And actually, I've been requested a few times that we do uh, an online immersion just in preconception because there's a whole beautiful science that arises from Ayurveda around preconception, around even before we conceive and during uh, pregnancy and prenatally, what we can do to really prepare for the invitation to a specific soul, but also how we can prepare that soul to come onto this planet in its fullness on every level, physically, emotionally, mentally. So safe herbs, prepping for birth or post-birth. For a lot of women, I suggest shatavari. Shatavari is the one we go to, but I want to say this very clearly, please be listening. So shatavari has estrogenic effects in the body. So if you have any history yourself or in your family of things like breast cancer or cervical cancer, this is not something that we necessarily suggest to be taken, or at least please work with an Ayurvedic doctor or work with your own doctor, your own healthcare provider to see whether or not this is a safe herb to take. Otherwise, it is a rasayana, it's a building herb, and shatavari means to possess a thousand husbands. So it means you become so feminized <laughs> that you can host and hold a thousand uh, lovers, a thousand husbands. So what that's really saying is that it will increase the estrogen to the level and it will also help the whole body to really be a nourishing force for a soul, to be a nourishing force for a body, to be a nourishing force for that being. And so in that way, shatavari has always been a revered herb to be used both in preconception as we're moving towards, as we want to increase our fertility, and also during pregnancy. Now, it was so beautifully outlined by the rishis, by the great uh, doctors of Ayurveda, that there were specific herbs and specific formulas that were taken during each one of the months, actually, in pregnancy. So this is something so specific that we can't go through, but that's a beautiful uh, understanding that each month different, as there's different development of the fetus, of the embryo, as everything is developing in different ways, that different herbs would be used during each one of those uh, months 
during those trimesters as well. And also different practices were suggested. Practices from certain mantra practices, meditation practices, pujas, rituals that would be done, as well as physical practices, how one was to be with, um, with their loved ones or their family or their partner during and after birth. So just so you have a little bit of an invitation to the beauty of that. And, um, and it's something that I sometimes work with women around is, is preconception and working together during pregnancy. And recently we had a woman in her late 30s who just uh, gave birth in such a beautiful uh, way in just two, three hours. <laughs> a beautiful labor and, uh, and so inspired to see the way in which she had a home birth. And really uh, she was inviting all the gifts of, of Ayurveda. And so I will often suggest to women to take our wild woman potion. It uh, is a great adaptogenic and a rasayana. It's a rejuvenative and it brings a lot of ojas to the system for um, fertility. Also post-birth, it's a wonderful one, safe as well during um, breastfeeding. And it can also be very safe during pregnancy. But if you have any questions at all or any concerns, see your healthcare provider or talk to me or talk to a doctor okay, specifically about it. Otherwise, taking shatavari, and there are different ways you can take shatavari. You could take it in a little bit of dairy or non-dairy milk uh, as a powder, mixing one teaspoon three times a day, especially um, for those of you who are challenged by any kind of fertility issues, uh, and also for rebuilding after birth, for what we often call the fifth trimester, actually, in Ayurveda, to really rebuild uh, mama after we've gone through labor, we can take a higher dosage, like three teaspoons every day. At those three different points, one teaspoon mixed in a little bit of non-dairy milk with honey is a great way to take it away from meals. Okay, I see we have Dr. Honey also on the call, which is very sweet as I'm speaking about honey, no pun intended. Hi everyone, seeing different beings saying hi. Oh, you're so welcome. Sheetal is asking, uh, what imbalances causes, what imbalance causes hair loss? So hair loss is usually caused uh, more often by a vata imbalance, usually. Occasionally, it will also occur during uh, or due to a pitta imbalance. As you can see, this is my, my hair as is, no dye or anything. And this is more a pitta imbalance. So you can see the gray in my hair um, since I was 20. This gray has actually been uh, been coming and banding uh, through. So usually when we see gray, it's more pitta. The fire is burning out the pigment in, in the hair. And I can definitely say since I was young, if you haven't already felt it, that there was heat here, right? So there was heat in different ways, fire in different ways. And, uh, and so that's also come in and, through, in and through the hair. But I definitely haven't lost the hair. So I have a lot of hair and I had even more hair before. Um, of course, as we age, we lose some of it. But vata imbalance, the hair tends to get even more fine. The hair tends to get very brittle. So there's no moisture to the hair. The hair also, of course, because uh, there's damage and dryness to the follicles, then also we start to lose the hair. Of course, genetics, uh, but also those genetics carry forth as well the doshic propensities. So this is something we might say, well, it's just genetic. But according to Ayurveda, your RNA, your DNA, you know, Dr. Vasant Lad, my beautiful Ayurvedic Guruji, he would so often say like RNA, DNA is the physical representation of the doshic energetics. So in that way, yes, it can be genetic, but that also has its own energetics to it, according to Ayurveda. So you may be given the, the sort of gift of the genetics. My mother also went gray early. She also has a lot of pitta. So, you know, that's there and it's carried through into uh, our offspring, into our children. So similarly, with losing our hair, and we will see it in women's lives as well, when we go through stress or we go through major transition, women will say, I had nice, lustrous, thick hair, now it's falling out in clumps, right? Or if vata starts to enter into the nervous system or the endocrine system, we start losing hair. So we see it with, um, with some of those conditions. So either high vata or at times pitta, but especially due to, um, due to vata. And so a few things that can be done. Generally, we want to pacify the root, not the symptom. So pacifying the root means really dealing with what's causing this vata imbalance. So looking at our lives, looking at our diet, looking at the various things that we might be engaging in that are heightening 
our vata and then softening that out, pacifying that out, choosing different ways, choosing a more medicinal aligned lifestyle that will allow for that vata, that air and ether, those elements of air and ether to be softened, which means living a little more grounded, living a little bit more uh, calm and cool, collected, right? And many of us might say, I don't even know what that looks like. So if our lifestyle and our diets and, and the things we've been ingesting have been very vata vitiating, have been very vata imbalancing, then that can be um, a reason why. And so we want to calm that out. And then we can also work directly on the area. So for example, one thing we have through uh, Ras Ayurveda is our um, hair oil, which is actually a head and hair oil. It balances vata in the mind. Before it even moisturizes and improves the quality of the hair, that's the intention of it. It has brahmi in it, it has spikenard in it, it also has more common herbs that you might know like rosemary or lavender, for example. And then it also has amazing base oils like many of you have heard before, for example, of argan or uh, black cumin seed. So these oils are wonderful for the follicles as well as for the hair quality, but they are more importantly excellent for the mind. Spikenard or Jatta Mamsi is so good for calming, for pacifying, for really grounding uh, the brain, the mind, and as well as Brahmi, which is excellent for um, stabilizing, it's excellent for increasing memory and cognitive functions. So by putting this hair oil onto the scalp, putting it onto the temples, placing it on the, not just the hair, but into the head, you'll actually start to see that it brings effects to decreasing vata in the mind. And then it also nourishes the hair and nourishes the scalp so that hair regrowth becomes possible. Also, uh, internally ingesting something like our adapt to life potion is an excellent, excellent way that you'll get Rasayana's rejuvenative herbs that will help to really strengthen and pacify vata internally, strengthen your ojas, and thus you'll see a manifestation in your nails, in your teeth, and also in your hair. We also have one other potion which is called our strong bones potion and I really suggest that one for anyone who wants uh, more strength in through if you're noticing that you have anything around osteopenia or osteoporosis or you're dealing with arthritis or you're dealing with the symptoms of that in through the nails or the teeth or the hair. The strong bones is an excellent potion to take internally that will help to strengthen all of that and you'll notice the manifestation in your hair as well. Okay, I guess we're going till eight this evening. It's wonderful to see you engaged. So uh, if this is how it continues in the weeks to come, then we'll take an hour. We said if um, we would start with half an hour for this first uh, couple months, and if it increased, that I would be more than willing to meet you for an hour each week in this way. So Biesha is asking, Shatavri can be taken during menopause as well. Absolutely, shatavri can be taken during menopause and it can be very helpful. So not only it can be, but I so often use shatavri during menopause because of the low um, estrogen. And so for a lot of women uh, with night sweats, with the challenges with sleeping, with low libido, with dryness, vaginal dryness, and all the various symptoms that can arise sometimes with menopause, shatavri can help. It will moisten, it will cool, it will uh, allow there to be that increased use Youthfulness, even in the skin, we start to notice. So using and having shatavri, having that wild woman potion during menopause or the standalone herb of shatavri is a very powerful one to take during um, menopause. So yes, absolutely. Namaste to all of you. Kimberly is asking, Hello, Tiffany. Can a pitta imbalance uh, cause dry red skin around the eyes? Maybe pitta tears? Absolutely. So this is a beautiful um, question as well. Actually, the, the taste of the tears and the way they drop through the eyes is even a manifestation of which dosha is flowing through us. So if we have sort of big, soft, voluptuous, sweet tears, they're said to come more uh, drawing, you know, down the face, these large tears from the outsides. Through the center is more pitta and they can be a bit more salty or sour. And then these very, you know, just slight tears that, uh, that tend to be a little bit more bitter can come from the innards of the eyes, more vata. So vata, pitta, and, and kapha. It's a beautiful way to think of it. And so absolutely, if we get redness anywhere, it can be an expression of pitta, a pitta imbalance. So this expression of excess fire. But the eyes actually have a direct relationship with pitta dosha. They're one of the secondary places where pitta expresses itself in the skin, also in the eyes, also in the liver. 
so there's a few other places in the mind and also in the in the gut and so if the eyes start to express that redness around the eyes or in the eyes or the sclera of the eyes starts to get yellow or red or bloodshot all of these things it can really be showing us that there may be a pitta imbalance and so generally again we can do two things one is we bring pitta down in the system overall and then we also bring some soothing to the area but we don't just treat things in ayurveda it's not a symptomatic approach so we don't just move to where the symptom is we don't just say okay let's fix the eyes then we look at why are the eyes expressing an imbalance so are you in your life you know going all the time doing all the time being fiery is there anger is there aggression is there frustration are you stressed all the time do you have a high stress position or a high stress job or a high stress life or a high stress family you know is they're kind of this all the time uh, racing, a fiery temperament in that way, being excessively competitive, whatever it might be. Are you ingesting things that are very fiery, watching things that are a little bit more aggressive, listening to things that are really amping you up? Like I think of the music, you know, when you go to work out, the music that they play, if you're listening to that music a lot all day, so when I would go to the gym, I would put my headset in and I would listen to satsang or podcast, right? So still there's like the output of working out, but the ingestion is something much more calming and softening. Once I even had someone say to me, what are you listening to over there? I'm interested. And I was able to share a couple, uh, a couple suggestions around satsangs and, and, uh, and some offerings. So absolutely, if pitta is amplified in your life, it will express itself in different ways. And one may be around the eyes. So generally calming our pitta from internal, so with our diet, eating things that are more cooling, calming, relaxing, soothing, think cucumber, think mint, you know, just giving you some, some very simple examples, aloe vera, all very cooling to take internally. Then if our lifestyle is really heating, then as I was saying before, avoiding or just softening some of those things, doing more restorative yoga, for example, rather than hopped up, uh, really racing, or pushing, kind of working out. Or if we're in environments that are way too fiery, then removing ourselves from those environments or changing those environments, dimming the lights, you know, like the light I have in here right now, using certain colors. These colors here, besides the red, is actually quite calming and soothing for my pitta, the, the, the gentle uh, yellow, and then also it looks a little bit more orange. But the gentle yellow and also, you know, this blue color, teal, it's very watery, so it's very soothing for pitta. And then um, we can also, and, and being in nature, being near water, taking these things in as well through the eyes like, uh, like water or a stream um, can be very cooling, the cooling of the greens. But then also directly on the eyes, one of the best things you can do, two things. One is that you can wash your eyes every day with clean, uh, temperate waters. So this is what's called chakshu dauti in the Vedic tradition, eye wash or eye cleansing. Just put your eye into cool, cleansed water and a few times rinse it and roll the eye around in it. Okay, and then do the same to the other eye. And then the other thing you can do is you can spray a little of rose water onto the area, very clean, pure rose water. We have an organic uh, rose water, very high quality rose water at Rasa. So you can look for that on the, the website. Or you can add a little rose water to the water that you're using in your eye cup or in your hand and wash the eye. So that's another option. And then another thing that you can do is you can apply kajal, what's called kajal. We have two minutes remaining before uh, Instagram will cut us off. It gives us a one hour time. So if we're not finished, I will hop back on, okay? Uh, the other is a kajal, which is an herbal eyeliner, and to put it on the inner of the eye, so to line it here. We also have kajal through Ras Ayurveda, and it has camphor in it, as well as almond oil and some other oils that help to moisten, soothe, and soothe and cool the eyes. So there are some suggestions. Shatavari powder, even better to take than pills, because then you avoid the capsules in the body. But if it's easier for you to take the capsules, if you're more apt to take the capsules in that way than to take the powder, then take it. And the last, what is the best face moisturizer for kapha? At Ross Ayurveda, we actually have a kapha facial elixir. And of course, I have to say, I formulated it. I might be a little bit biased that, um, that it's one of the best moisturizers. Uh, at this time that you can use that will moisturize but not increase oil that will actually help to balance the skin out so that the skin's not excessively oily but also that dullness is stimulated it wakes up and cleanses the pores at the same time giving you a nice moisturizing effect ah oh, 
So many blessings to each and every one of you. We're just under an hour offering you so much love, so much peace. May all beings truly, truly be free through the gift of this time. Even though it's challenging, may it be a gift for us all to really be at home in ourselves and with our families and to really, to really, really question and, and come to, to really inquire into the importance of our lives and the importance of, of this coming together as one human family. Namaste to each and every one of you, and we'll see each other again uh, on next Thursday. Or you can hop onto my Instagram as well, Tiffany.